Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Rebecca Cooper. I am the Director of Communications and Research for the Representation Project. We are a nonprofit organization founded by Jennifer Siebel Newsom that uses both film and campaigns to challenge harmful gender norms and stereotypes. And this interview today is part of a larger series on uh, interviewing experts on masculinity as part of our Boys Will Be Boys campaign. And that campaign we are very proud of. Um, the Boys Will Be Boys campaign is to expose how traditional masculinity restricts men and boys and to create a space where they can be their real full potential self. Um, boys Will Be Boys means that they can be anything and everything they wanna be without the constraints of, res of restrictive masculinity. Um, and we will be having these expert interviews every Thursday at the same time, talking about um, how to affirm and lift up boys and men with the nation's foremost experts on the topic. So definitely make sure you tune in and join us. Today, I am so honored to be the person that gets to interview Dr. Gary Barker. Um, we've I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Barker in partnerships for almost a decade now, and I have been a longtime admirer and follower of his work. Uh, and I'm just so grateful that he is here, and I'm so excited that you all get to hear from him today. So let me start by telling you about Dr. Barker. Dr. Barker is an international voice for healthy manhood, gender equality, and violence prevention. He holds a master's in public policy from Duke University and a PhD in de developmental psychology from Loyola University of Chicago. Dr. Barker is also the founder and CEO of Equimundo, Center for Masculinities and Social Justice. We love Equimundo, um, an international organization that works globally, including in the US, to engage men and boys in healthy masculinities. Gary Barker has led global action to engage men as fathers and as caregivers um, and has co-authored the State of the World's Fathers Reports. Dr. Barker has received an Ashoka Fellowship, an Open Society Fellowship, and a Voices of Solidarity Award from Vital Voices for his research and activism. In 2019, he was named by Apolitical as one of the 100 most influential persons in gender equality globally. So let that sink in. Dr. Barker advises UN agencies, corporations, and governments on engaging men as allies in gender equality. He holds a research affiliate position at the University of Coimbra, Portugal, and his four novels, Louisa's Last Word, The Afghan Vampires Book Club, Mary of Kivu, and The Museum of Lost Love, draw on his experiences of working in conflict-affected settings then have been praised for creating stories of grace and passion out of some of the world's most violent places. He lived nearly 20 years in Central and South America, and he currently lives in Washington, D.C. So round of applause. Welcome, Dr. Barker. We are so grateful to have you here with us today. Um, so let's jump right in. My first question for you is tell us about your path to a career uh, promoting healthy masculinity for boys and men. How did you arrive here? What's your personal story? Uh, how did you get to this place doing this incredible work? Several things. One, I had, you know, the the um, amazing gift of a father whose career was as a social worker. And he really centered care as his political and personal ethic, right? He just lived a version of nonviolent manhood without calling it that necessarily. He just, you know, that was his cause. And so our dinner table conversations, the, you know, you're not, we're not going to have guns in this household. Um you know, his, his, the way he spoke about, you know, the women who worked in the organizations where he worked was just to me, you know, this was the way men should be. Um, outside the home, things were not necessarily that way. We, I grew up partly in California, partly in Houston, Texas. Um, and there was a version of manhood that, you know, kind of ruled that was um, too often in the harm. It was, you know, and, and a little bit in Southern Texas, you could say it's around pickup trucks and guns and, you know, lots of other things we could add to that. Um, so I had this contrast between the manhood that was at home and the manhood I saw around me. And then it sort of came to, you know, a, what I mean, a, you know, a violent head when I um, witnessed a school shooting. And it was a young man killing another in front of about 100 of us who were having lunch. And he did so because he said, you stole my girlfriend and I will make you pay. I mean, essentially what we call in other parts of the world, and this is, you know, this is, I know this is harsh just to drop that in there, but it is part of how I got to this space. Um, I mean, essentially that was like a masculine honor killing. Um, it was like, these are the versions of manhood 
at their worst. Lots of other things, of course, at play there, mental health and a history of bullying and school challenges. But it led to a lot of conversations around how do we make men so and what do we need to do to, to interrupt that? And how can we you know, build on the potential of the healthy, caring manhood that's all around us at the same time? A um, couple of friends who were gay and talked about, you know, just how much they stayed in the closet because they felt, you know, the fear of that constantly. The number of girls, friends who talked about an instance of coercion or pressure or harassment from a boy or man, it just, yeah, became keenly aware of it and said, there's something I can do here. I first worked with survivors of violence. Um, that was that was what kind of called me to, you know, how do I support those who have experienced violence? And over the years, particularly connecting with brave women in Latin America who um, put their, you know, put their lives literally on the line to call out men's violence, said, there's more I can do to be talking about prevention and healthy ideas about manhood. Um, and so I think really the, you know, the push to make this into the career and to create the organization that I helped create was a lot of amazing feminist women in Latin America who, when I said, you know, what should men, you know, should men be in the space? Are we, and they said, absolutely. Let's talk about what we can do together. Um, so all the above. Wow. Talking about, you know, boys will be boys and all of the different types of masculinity. It's really just fascinating to hear about your experience, you know, seeing a school shooting and then coming home to a father who's a care worker and a social worker and, you know, prom promoting care. It just yeah what a range. Um, okay. So let's bring it to today. So to talk about contemporary experiences of boys and men in the U S what, you know, what have you seen that has changed, especially you've done extensive research in this area. So, um, what is the status of boys and men today when it comes to their happiness and other aspects of their life? Yeah. You know, I think we're, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, researchers and activists and men and boys talking about their lives at the moment. And there's, you know, there's a lot to be concerned about, and yet I'm also slightly hopeful. So maybe I'll start with the, you know, <laughs> what troubles me uh, yeah. a, a lot. And we've just done a big study on this called State of American Men. And, you know, there's a lot to be worried about, particularly younger men. Um, young men we talked to, ages 18 to 23, a nationally representative sample, and then talking to lots of other men about the results of the study. You know, one is just this crisis of connection. Um, two thirds of young men told us that nobody really knows me. I mean, what a, you know, what a call for wow. loneliness and a feeling that I'm about a third of them don't see anybody outside their home on a weekly basis. I mean, that's a lot of time spent on a screen or by yourself or in your bedroom or just with your family, which can also, which can be great, but it does say just like, you know, the social isolation that we're in, that's a mixture of stuff, covid you know, the new workplace that where lots of us are working from home and just lots of men confused, you know, where do I go from here? About half of young men telling us they've thought about suicide in the last two weeks. Um, large numbers of them finding solace online. And we've just been doing a big project with a couple of colleagues looking at what is this big space where men, young men are in particular online. Um, and I think we often want to step into the negative and we'll call it the manosphere and we'll label it and you know, we'll sort of get nervous about the harm, which is there, but at least two thirds, if not 70% or more of what we're seeing of where young men hang out online is a call for help and connection and finding companionship. Um, most wow. of that stuff is really legitimate stuff of just trying to find your way in the world. Um, there's a portion of that that becomes, hey, no one else is listening to you. So you should blame everybody else for your troubles and pulls into, you know, some of the darker misogynist, angry sides of the internet, which is there and it's real. Um, and we know that it can contribute to things like, you know, school shootings and followings of men who openly espouse violence toward women. We know there's that harm, but I think we have to look and say 70% of it, and it is millions of young men going to different sites and spaces are about trying to be their best selves. And so that's where I find the optimism to say, guys are asking for help. Are we willing to step into it and provide that help and connection? And just most of the time, it's not even help. It's just listening um, mm. as they try to find their way. And then behind a lot of this is a feeling that, you know, the world has sort of become 
safer for women and girls. It's we're not done with that by any means, and there's a huge amount of harm that happens every day. But there's been, you know, a concerted effort to talk about we want the world to be safe and for girls and women to have all the opportunities that they deserve. As father of a daughter, you know, who is now in her early 20s, you know, th there was a lot of things to be able to say how to talk to your daughter about being everything she can be. We, I don't think we've had the same kind of conversation about what we expect of young men in the world today. And Me Too and a lot of very necessary correctives that are, again, they're not done by any means, but they've been a lot about saying what you shouldn't do as men and mm -hmm. not a lot about what you should do. What's the version, like we, we know how to call out, but where's the calling in part and what does that look like? And I think we see this confusion just playing out in a big way. And then I'll, you know, then I'll stop on this point, you know, for all the concern of the study, we're also excited that maybe one in five, when we asked about a series of ways that you could participate in making the world better around gender equality, speaking up for women who had experienced violence or harassment, being part of racial justice or LGBTI plus issues, about one in five guys seem like they're doing something related to that. Um, that's not bad considering that we don't have, you know, many nationwide visible, I mean, truly visible campaigns, right? We're doing a lot of, you guys are doing a lot of great stuff. Us, Call to Men, Futures Without Violence. You know, um, we've got Justin Baldoni and, and Man Enough. There's lots of stuff out there. We're still, you know, all those groups, all of us together are still far smaller, you know, in, in terms of just how big we are as a country. And so given that there's kind of no national platform for talking about, for talking to young men, that's not bad that one in five are kind of ready, like, call me in. I am ready to be a force for some good stuff in this world. And I think that tells us, you know, can we together, like, can we turn up the volume on all the stuff, the stuff you're doing, the stuff, you know, those groups that I just mentioned are doing. So that part gives me hope that um, there's a lot of guys like ready to be on the right page on these issues. Yeah, I appreciate that framing. It's, you know, especially with those stats are so bleak, 50% considering suicide in the last two weeks and yeah. the the loneliness um, and the isolation. But it is it is hopeful to, to hear the hopeful framing yeah. um, also. Um, okay, so can could you give us some more insight? I know you touched on the manosphere and, you know, what that means, how that can, you know, what it actually is and how it can be positive in some sense. Um, but when we talk about the manosphere and we think about the negative messages that boys and men are getting, um, can you tell us more about what restrictive ideas they're consuming or being um, being fed, basically, what societal messages are keeping them in the in the box? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the... I mean, sort of at the core of it is this feeling that I'm losing my place, right? That if if manhood means, and if you ask, you know, lots of young men what it means these days, right? It is, I've got to be successful. And success is kind of the first word that comes to mind. And it's often about, it's about work, or at least it's about some version of work that brings me some money and some status. It's having a relationship. And I didn't talk about that part, which is the third of, the third of men in the U.S. who aren't in a meaningful relationship at the moment, and the high percentage of those who don't even think they will find a meaningful, mm. intimate partnership, partner relationship these days. So it's it's those things, right? That you've got to show that you're, you know, that one, you know, you've got to look great from your hours at the gym. So we've got this body idealization that women and girls have lived with and still live with. Now there's it's it's happening to boys and men in a different way. You got to be successful. You got to be able to show that you're successful, right? So you got to have enough money or income to be this, you know, status high guy. Um, and you've got to have a relationship which too often gets framed as, you know, I get to be the one in charge. You're going to do what I want. Some of that is fueled by also the other point from our research and that lots of others are looking at is just how much time young men are spending watching porn and getting ideas. Not all of that is negative. Some of that can be you know, ways to be part of a healthy adult erotic sexual life. But a lot of that is about she will do whatever I want. She plural, she will be, and you, you, I don't need to say much more about that, but a lot of that is about, you know, sex is the way I want it, when I want it. And it's kind of women and sex to be consumed as a part, as, a, as opposed to a meaningful relationship. So we've got that perfect storm of what guys think they have to be. I've got to be in charge. I've got to be this successful guy who gets all these things, which in today's, you know, kind of post-COVID 
confused work moment where so many folks are being squeezed and have to do two jobs to make what they used to do in one job feels like, you know, what we might call just pure economic precarity, that I'm just not going to make it. And the number of young men who told us, and one of these quotes that we saw online, I thought was so telling. It's like, hey, other dudes, how many of you think about the fact that you're not going to make as much money as your grandfather or your father, and you don't know who to talk about it? Anybody else had that problem? And there's like tens of thousands of, you know, likes to that message. Wow. Now, you know, we might want to step into that and say, oh, welcome to the club, right? So I don't know what the ethnicity of this guy is, right? But we might want to tell some middle-income guys like, hey, welcome to what women have faced, people of color have faced, welcome to this unequal world that many others have faced. That's not a satisfactory answer <laughs> to somebody who is worried about trying to, whatever, start a family, have enough money to pay his rent to get the things he thinks he wants. That's not a bad desire. And that you look, and it is kind of an objective fact that if you're in the middle or lower income, the chances of being where your parents were is not good. I mean, it's pretty bleak. Um, and I don't think we have been kind of generous or open-hearted enough to listen to that deep concern of a lot of young men. Um, and it's a hard conversation to have because too often we do want to start with, hey, if you looked at all, all the other inequalities, yours might have to come later, which is really tough. <laughs> I mean, I think that is one of, you know, that's that's politicians are having trouble having that conversation, right? Um, and it's so easy to step in in that moment and be the fill in the blank. We could name Andrew Tate. We could name Donald Trump. We could name many others who are able to play into that sense of economic precarity and immediately turn it into the problem is everybody else who is taking your job. They might be taking, you know, the person you thought that you had the right for them to be your boyfriend, girlfriend. They are taking, you know, they're taking your space. They're making you the scapegoat. It's so easy for that victim language and that kind of angry version of manhood to take hold because, I mean, obviously we want to call out those who are calling or using that harmful language. But I think we on the progressive side also have to think about what are we doing that we're not listening to that sense of precarity that too many young men are feeling? Yeah, it reminds me, If for everybody in the audience, if you haven't seen Dr. Barker's TED Talk, please watch this right after. Um, and it, there's so many things you said that stuck out to me, but one of the things that I left with was really just, are we listening? Are we responding? Are we keeping the conversation going? And, you know, yeah. with empathy and, you know, what is the, what is the consequence of not doing that? Um, makes me think of exactly what you're saying. Um, yeah. So to, you know, to take the hope train for a second, what would it look like for uh, men's liberation here? What, what's the end goal? What, what does ha healthy masculinities look like and how do we get there? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I do think that lots of guys are living it, right? I mean, I think as we talk about healthy or harmful versions of manhood, you know, that often becomes sort of fighting words, right? And certainly that, you know, the expression we've used for the last years of toxic masculinity is just like, we need to sort of put that in a dusty box and write 2021 on it or something and just put it away. <laughs> just put it over there and say, and I think healthy, you know, we use that expression healthy masculinity as well, but it's not, it's not a conversation starter. I mean, I think it's it's kind of asking men, you know, what are, you know, what does it mean to be a good man to you? What does it mean to be a good human? And open up that conversation. And there's probably very few male identified individuals who won't be able to list a lot of qualities that, you know, kind of all of us want, right? How to be, how to care for those around you, how to be honest and decent, you know, to to those around you, how to find a meaningful Real intimate partner relationship that's based on respect and not on domination, how to find ways that you, you know, resolve tensions and conflicts that don't involve violence. Because mm. even guys who use it, there are some who get, you know, a strange pleasure out of it. Most of them can realize that it's a, fa it, you failed someplace along the way, you lost it when you reached out and used, when you use violence instead of reaching out with dialogue. Um, Self-care, add that to it, right? Just that not just self-care, like I, you know, buy something that smells good and I, and I shower in that, but that I take care of my, that I'm an emotionally, you know, fragile human who needs to connect with others and acknowledge when I'm not doing so well, things that I can do to both 
you know, kind of hold myself together in tough moments, but even more important that I reach out and ask for help from others. Most men, if we don't say, let's talk about healthy masculinity, but if we just say, you know, what does it mean to be a good man or a good human? Most men, young men, boys can mention those things. And I think that has to fill up more of our airtime and more of our conversations, like assuming that our sons, you know, come into the conversation, that boys come into that conversation wanting good, not, you know, not ready to, to cause harm and havoc around them. Um, so, yeah, I guess I, you know, anytime some, we, we design attitude scales and we measure this stuff <laughs> and that's one way to think about it. But I think, you know, in real life, it's kind of stepping into a conversation and breaking those boxes apart and just saying, what does it mean to you? And the stuff that's going to be harmful, how do we sit with it and have, oh, but tell me more about that one. Like, why do you think that's okay? that you don't have to get consent for, you know, around sex or that your partner's not equal to you or that it is okay to use certain forms of violence against her, that your voice matters more than hers if you're talking about a heterosexual relationship. Let's push back on that. Like, why do you, you know, why do you think that's okay? I think it's, you know, stepping into that kind of, that dialogue and breaking down a little bit our, our words to acknowledge that we're in like this really strange space where we talk about this stuff. <laughs> To acknowledge that most of the people we want to reach with our messages don't use this language. So I don't know if that was helpful, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we, you know, we have the same conversation around like what is what language is alienating and how can we be yeah. a Trojan horse in spaces to bring up? Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I, I see I might some add, I might, yeah, if it, just might add to one one point I want yeah. to make as well. The one where we find kind of the like the easiest lane on this mm -hmm. is around caregiving. Um, you know, I mean, that's another, you know, in the hope lane or the hope train, which is that guys are doing more, you know, men who are fathers or who have other ties to children are doing more of the hands-on caregiving than we did in the past. Um, and even, you know, in that, that even goes across the political spectrum that, you know, Republican conservative guys are doing this too, because the world made us do more of this because women are in the workplace and that's the right thing to do. And we all need that. And that's equality. And so I think the world is making men do more of it. And I think as men do it, we get this positive feedback loop that, oh, there's a lot of work that goes on. Nobody really likes to clean, you know, the, the toilet or the kitchen after, you know, making a crazy meal. But we do love the endorphin rush we get when we hang out with our children or with our elderly parent. And we do that in a meaningful, connected way. So I think that's where I see a place where, you know, there's like an instant what you know way to define healthy masculinity, the care you provide to others, which, you know, 90 plus percent of us do. Right. I love how that ties back to what your father did and, and what he stood yeah. for too. That's awesome. I see there's so many great questions coming in here. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A, please, and we will answer them. I've got a couple more questions first before we get there. Sure. Uh, but just talking about, so, you know, Equimundo does it all, the, the attitude scales, the research, the engaging with masculinity, obviously the, the reports on fathers and what care work is. Um, can you tell us more about what Equimundo does and how people can support your work? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, we stepped into the space, um, our first years when I started the organization in Brazil was testing community-based approaches. How do we engage men to be allies in this, you know, and particularly around ending violence against women? Um, and in the, you know, kind of as we tried to think, how do we go from those small scale conversations that were working, they were achieving change to actually, you know, going bigger and listening to not going bigger, like we needed to hire more people and have bigger budgets, but to have more impact mm -hmm. that it's not just about reaching a handful of men or even a few hundred, like how do we change the forces around us, right? Workplaces, policies, the, you know, the media that we consume, um, all those things that shape us, the way that we're parented, all those things that make us who we are as men, how do we change those so that we could kind of multiply the volume of this? And so a part of that has been doing policy-focused research that we talk to the UN and big corporations and governments. We spend a lot of our time in dialogue with governments of what the data tells us of mm -hmm. how we can engage men. So our, our main areas of action, one you could tell is our fatherhood work. We have a global men care campaign, 60 plus countries. We advise on parental leave policies, on campaigns. We do programmatic work that we try to build into early childhood training or into the health sector in some countries to just make men's caregiving normal. 
and to have that be part of the global attention that's happening around who does the hands-on care of our homes and bodies and children every day. Other pieces, violence prevention. I know you all do a lot of work on that as well. How do we engage men and, and boys as allies um, applying what we know about, a, about prevention science to breaking cycles of violence? A lot of that is about trauma. And we've designed some trauma approaches, understanding how violence in men's lives is made most often with the violence we experience. Our third area is boy is it's gender, you know, just starting young. So gender socialization to call it that. That's the big, you know, the big term. But really to start this at younger ages. So we do work with boys um, like you all do, of like we need to start this conversation even earlier, right? When we're making sense of this, you know, from preschool and even before. And then um, fourth is a lot of our politically focused research on we're worried about the global backlash against feminism and working with a lot of partners on how do we make sense of what's happening and some of the data that I just shared is about that. And then how do we step into conversations um, that try to bring men along as allies that need to go beyond what I perceive at the moment, which is kind of a panic mm -hmm. um, among progressive political leaders, among femi feminist leaders of you know, men are going backwards. We, we're kind of stepping into a panic mode, um, which doesn't, I mean, we need to be aware and there's a reason to be panicked about it as we watch Roe v. Wade being overturned. And we can, you know, we can make a long list in the US and elsewhere where this stuff is going backwards, but we've got to step into it moving beyond the panic to really think about how, what will draw men into this conversation simply besides yelling at them that they're wrong, um, which I think is kind of the mode we're, we're too often in. I have been part of that. <laughs> I want to, I'm part of that yelling as well. So how do we step into that and say it's going to take more sophisticated approaches than just that? Yeah. Wow. So, so many reasons why we love Equimundo and love partnering with y'all. Um, and yes, please, if you all haven't read these reports, um, I'm sure we'll, we'll send them out in a follow-up email, but you should definitely check them out. The data is staggering um, and the data stories are moving. Um, I have another question for you, but this question from an attendee is actually better for to it. It kind of goes straight into what we were just talking about. So mm -hmm. thinking globally, what's going on and kind of zooming out. I, I, so often we are talking about the United States and our data is mostly focused on what's happening here. Um, but this attendee is asking, how does the state of manhood and boyhood in the U.S. compare to what's happening happening globally? And are you seeing the yeah. same trends? There's pretty similar trends happening in a lot of the world. We've done um, a multi-country survey called Images, the International Men and Gender Equality Survey. We've carried it out since 2008, nine in nearly 60 countries, often in partnership with the United Nations. Um, and pretty consistently, it shows the younger generation of men have more conservative views about gender equality than their father's generation. Wow. Um, at the same time, Younger women, just about everywhere we've looked, have more demands for gender equality than their mother's generation does. So you've got this perfect storm, so to speak, of young women saying, yeah, I deserve full equality and my full voice in the world, and young men who are going backwards on these topics. Now, that's big trends, right? There's obviously all kinds of stuff in between. But, you know, in some more recent data out of parts of Europe, the UK, there's some stuff elsewhere in Western Europe. There's a couple of studies in Latin America finding that in most countries these days, it's kind of 50% of men think feminism has gone too far and 50% are either okay with it or um, or supportive of it, you know, just that, that is actively supportive. So, I mean, that's which kind of resonates with a lot of our election, out, election outcomes these days, right? That we're kind of, you know, and men are even more likely to vote conservative leaning for all those reasons I gave, right? The kind of this sense of... Um, economic precarity and the sense that, and particularly, you know, the impact of the necessary urgent impact of women's voices saying harassment in the workplace, inequality in the workplace, inequality in care work, inequality of us in political positions is not okay. Rather than men saying, yeah, that's right. That's a fundamental human rights justice issue that I should be on board with. Lots of men are taking it like, oh, you're accusing me. You're taking an opportunity away from me. This is against me. Um, so I think we've got, there's a real backlash. There's a real economic precarity. And then lastly, I'd say we on the progressive side have been woefully bad at talking to men, listening to men and finding the way to kind of build greater alliances with men. Wow. Yeah. To, and wild to think about, 
you know, younger generations being more conservative, but also doing more care work. What a conundrum that is. Right. Thinking about, yeah. <laughs> woo. Um, a couple comments from guests. So the first is from Tim Warnett. I'm shocked and concerned about the gap between young women who are more likely to be feminist and young yeah. men who are more likely to embrace white wing, right wing extremism. And for Tim, yeah. to Tim's credit, I think that they put that in before we even started talking about it. So yes, agree. And then somebody also asked, Margaret asked if we'll be um, recording this and yes, we will record this. We are recording this and we'll make it available. Um, this question from an attendee also applies to what we were just talking about. Um, you know, the concept of how to have these conversations with boys and men and what we're doing wrong um, yeah. is fascinating to me. Um, this attendee asked, what advice do you have for starting these conversations around masculinity with boys and men in our own communities? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, everywhere, all the time, any chance you get. <laughs> you know, I think the biggest one is kind of stepping in with just uh, as as tough as it is to step in with just deep listening, right? Um, tell me, you know, and if if you want to figure, you know, where is it that young men are most likely to be these days? Someplace online, right? You know, tell me, hey, you know, what what are what are the conversations you're participating in there? How's it going for you? Um, and I and I think you know we've got a big mistrust to get past, which is most boys and men think we're going to come in preaching a message mm. instead of coming in with just, I'm here to listen. Um, and can we be okay and step in with gentle questioning when you're likely to tell us something that you're looking at online or tell, or, or in, interested in that we're like, you know, that, that is not okay with us, <laughs> but how do we step into that conversation, you know, with, a, with a sense of, tell me more about that. Hmm. And is there some stuff about it that troubles you? Um, so, you know, that if he says, hey, I'm looking at, and Andrew Tate's the most famous, but there's certainly many others online that they might be looking at, or one of the gaming platforms that they're looking at, and the streamer might be saying all kinds of misogynist and et cetera stuff, but to step into that with kind of a question, how's it going? Mm -hmm. And I'd say, you know, it's kind of obvious, but we've got to step in where they are. Um, so if it's on the gaming platform, we're going to be playing with our sons occasionally. Um, and maybe they don't want us to know about one of those games they're playing, but maybe there's one of them that we can sort of be on there together and use that as a conversation. Um, it is, you know, being able to ask it a lot because it's really tough. You know, one of the things that we've gotten really, we get really good at as boys and men is just to go, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, no, nothing. Um, you know, it's really good just to like, that just shuts it down. I don't have to be vulnerable. I don't have to acknowledge I'm scared shitless about X or Y, right? It just like, I'm cool. And I just go back and close the door, look at my screen and we're, we're over how to, you know, just be there gently and you're there the next day and you're there the next day. And it might be, you know, it might be five conversations later that it's finally coming out. Um, you know, I um, I don't know if these magic three questions work, but with a colleague, we were doing lots of conversations with some angry men during COVID. And we kind of found that three questions could get us pretty deep into a into a conversation. <laughs> okay. One just a like a real how's it going? Not like don't tell me the 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 it's fine, like we all do that of just the get on with the day, but like a real how's it going? with, and, and I, you know, I, I mean it, like, tell me, tell me what's up. And maybe I model by sharing something that's bothering me or that's tough for me to talk about. And then I sort of prime the space. And the next one is tell me who you care about. Um, and we all have somebody we care about, even the most estranged relationship, right? And to allow that space. Most often, you know, it's going to be a mom, <laughs> maybe a partner. It's going to be a woman or a girl who's probably, you know, the main care person around, how do you care for that person? Tell me how that goes. Um, you know, and typically that kind of, and then if you feel like it's going well, the part that we're having such trouble getting past in the US is the, how do we get beyond when we've caused somebody else wrong or mm. harm? And that's this whole calling out um, moment that we're in, right? Of, and we need to, it is, it is a fantastic success of women's rights that we've reached a space that men in power know they can be called out for harm. But I think all of us, it means like, I don't want to acknowledge any of that because that's all that happens to me now. Instead of saying, we all have caused somebody harm at some point. We all have abused a piece of our power. And that's not only male identified individuals. How do we step into a moment of what, what is a 
what does a real apology look like? What does it look like to say, hey, I, I, I messed up there. Like how, how can I, you know, meaningfully move beyond it? Um, so you know, those typically of like trial and error <laughs> yeah. have been ones that I've tried the most to get into meaningful conversations with. Um, I participate in a group of male facilitators where we do those, some variation of those three questions with ourselves. Cause we could talk, once you get us talking, we will talk for hours. Most about, at least those first two things, how's it going? <laughs> And how can you talk about that? And like, who do you care for and who cares for you? Um, if guys can really get opened up about that, they'll talk for a couple of hours. Yeah, I I love that. I am, and I also like the idea of getting into their video game with them and, you know, uh, deconstructing media with them. I am known for annoying the crap out of my nieces and nephews as they <laughs> watch Disney Channel and pointing out everything that makes me angry and everything that I'm excited about. They're just like, shut up so we can watch. Yeah, Blue. Exactly. Um, that's fantastic advice. Um, Clara asks, how do you understand how your work ties into efforts to deconstruct the patriarchy and also deconstruct our binary understanding of gender? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there's no way to have a conversation about what we mean by masculinities without like breaking out of the, you know, the, the heterosexism and the homophobia that's so part of it. Right. I mean, that's, you know, ask any 10 year old boy does not get through middle school and even often before, right, where the measure, the thing we call you is that so gay or any of the other homophobic, transphobic language that we use. Um, so there's no way not to have this conversation that also says, you know, as we step out of this idea that these are things that men have to do, we also have to step out of the, the idea that, you know, that the only sexuality has got to be heterosexual and that even even lots of the loaded ways that we frame heterosexual relationships, um, the harm spills over, that men should dominate, that our sex, that our sexuality is uncontrollable, that, you know, that, that no means yes, and all the rest of the stuff that gets built into those myths. Um, and then I do think, you know, I, I guess as I as I project, like if I talked about those three questions as maybe a place to start, right? Mm -hmm. How's it going for you? Who cares about you? How do you get beyond when you've caused some harm? Then we start to go into the graduate school conversations. <laughs> and that's where I want you to think of, you know, if 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 the next conversations, which could be, you know, also with a friend that I know is having some challenges in his relationship because of how he might be treating his partner. And it's about, you know, some unquestioned ideas about the power and privilege that he has. And that's at the individual level, right? And then we also need to get that conversation going up the chain, you know, at places of power in, you know, whether that's a workplace, so that we get men to be aware of that and to acknowledge what does that mean that we get this unquestioned power and privilege? What do we do about it? I think our challenge with using, and this is where the language has been fantastic for us to call it what it is, but it it's not a starting point for me to have a conversation with a CEO at a corporation to go, yeah, let's talk about patriarchy. It's kind of, it's an, it just the way that, that um, we, it's a, it is a necessary analysis of power, but how do I get him, in this case, let's talk about a man, how do I get him to think about what's the power that's inherent here and what concretely can you do about it? Sometimes I want you to sit with the discomfort, but sometimes I really need to take advantage of the fact that I might have an hour with you right. to work with you on what are some things you could do that question the inequalities in the organization and to make it a better place that would be for that you won't just immediately turn off and say, well, get that guy out of my, you know, my C-suite office. Um, so I think it's how do we get into the concrete of that um, rather than just, you know, kind of throwing it out there as art, which we need to do to analyze, you know, the, the deep inequalities in the country. But how do we step into here's some things you can do, whether it's looking at the, you know, the, the salary gap between the lowest paid workers in your workforce to the highest paid, to being transparent about who gets promoted to which jobs, to being transparent about who gets a seat at the table, what kinds of language spoken and unspoken gets the attention. Um, so kind of all the above, but really trying to turn it into like, what's the concrete right. that otherwise we just end up with so many you know, the pushback, the turn off, the, well, that right. was interesting. And the, you know, the screen is slamming, the door is closing. And um, we have felt good about calling out, but we haven't really achieved anything. 
Yeah. So that's the theme that keeps coming up of meeting men and people where they're at and all the delicate art it is to keep multiple versions of a conversation happening in different spaces. You know, yeah. I, it reminds me of the work we've done working with studio execs. Again, their time is precious. And either yeah. we're having a conversation about the nuanced stereotypes that um, they can flip in the work they're creating, or we're convincing them to care about how fat people are represented, right? It's like totally two, two different extremes, but important. both of them are important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So another question from an attendee, you spoke to the influence of the manosphere and online communities. What is the role of mainstream media in influencing our ideas around masculinity? Um, and then a follow-up question, is there any media that's getting it right with nuanced portrayals of boys and men? Mm, yeah, we're just starting that one. Um, I mean, we've we've had the, you know, the pleasure of partnering with the folks at the Gina Davis Institute and who do some similar kinds of analysis that you all do and, you know, in, in connection with some execs as well. And so do feel like um, that, you know, holding up a mirror of how storytelling is taking place online of just showing, you know, how much the tropes of, you know, the deadbeat dad or the tropes of um, the abusive or emotionally distant father who exists, obviously, but also just to say, you know, let's hold up some more stories of all, you know, deep and meaningful caregiving that men are doing. Um, we found those conversations really, really useful. And both, you know, that mixture of calling out and calling in, so, you know, on, on some of the ones we could say are getting it right, and this is now a couple of years old, but, you know, part of what we did was to call out some of the harmful stuff, but we also called in colleagues from This Is Us, um, mm -hmm. one that showed, you know, I don't, my, in my um, household, it was like our weekly permission to cry TV show. During yes. COVID. <laughs> yes. It's just, just like, okay, I should drink less wine tonight and watch <laughs> This Is Us to cope with the madness that's going on at the moment in the world. And so, I, you know, I think it is calling in shows where there are great stories being told. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think there are some mainstream ones like that. I mentioned before, I think um, the stuff that Man Enough is doing really appreciate sort of the use of both how, you know, Justin and his storytelling with the stuff that they produce is telling really amazing stories. And he's making a living, right, on a brand that is about showing caring masculinity. So, you know, just want to do that, that shout out. I think, you yeah. know, it does show that, hey, guys can, you know, you can do this. Mike McGrory has also been, you know, both using his name as an actor and, you know, calling out being, being there. So, you know, just to give a couple of names there. And then lesser known, just online, we, as we've done this, worked with with partners to do what we've been calling data scraping and looking at stuff. There are lots of threads online of influencers who have 100,000 followers and others. I'm not going to name right. them now, but who are saying all kinds of cool stuff. So there's, you know, big screen stuff that's on, you know, a major network. And then there's lots of small scale stuff with 100,000 followers out there doing some, you know, doing some cool stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think it's it's kind of, Let's not have, I think it's easy um, to to even, and one of the things that young men told us is like, don't even use the word manosphere. It's mm. now as loaded as toxic masculinity in many ways. Wow. So it's like, talk about our own online lives. And then even, you know, you've got to go granular. Like, wh which thread are you talking about? Um, you know, and I think we could also look at Reddit as an interesting success story, right? Right. They went from like, you know, like the, you know, misogynist central um, to saying, actually, if we want to do okay when our, with our bottom line and we want to do an IPO, we've got to clean up our act. And so I, you know, I think nine out of 10 times, we need more than the profit motive to right. get <laughs> companies to do right. But I'm also, you know, I also want to call out when, and that was a bit of both, right? There was a lot of call out of Reddit for the, for the shit that they mm -hmm. allowed to happen, right? That's where we take our voice as civil society. But also just folks who are like, oh, you know what? We're going to be better as a company and actually flourish if we do this better and clean up. And there's lots of great threads on Reddit that are about men trying to, you know, do the right thing. The other, I'll just one last one. Fatherhood blogs and spaces are all over the place. Yeah. The stay-at-home dads, you know, are a couple, there's a couple of million of them now in the U.S. The number of blogs from... Um, a company, you know, a company of dads, which is, you know, bringing the groups together, fathering together, um, a lot of the fathers of color who have experienced all kinds of discrimination and racism in the 
child welfare system and the job market and lots coming together on spaces as well. Like if I see, you know, among slightly older men, um, there's a huge flourishing space of dad blogs and dad bloggers and dads finding connection online is kind of like trying to find our identity in being fathers, not just I got to do this and pick up her from childcare and do this part, but finding like this is this is who I am. This is part of my identity. So I think that part's that excites me a lot. Obviously, I'm a dad. So that I mean, I said I mentioned that before. Um, so I do find that as like men getting to and it's without it's it's sometimes without um they didn't necessarily have some conversation of stepping into healthier masculinity. It was just the world made them do this. Mm -hmm. and as they develop this amazing bond with their children, there's no going back, right? right? Whatever else happens to them that could be, you know, including causing harm, perhaps, that connection with their child starts to become a frame, you know, and I think it allows us to then connect with men who cause harm, um, you know, either whether in the violence against a female partner or other kinds. Um, so I really think that's, you know, I, I lean into that one a lot as well. Yeah, I, I have a couple more questions for you. This one might play on some of the themes you just talked about. And this is a question after my own heart. What research into masculinities or initiatives promoting healthy masculinity do you want to see in the future? Mm, um, you know, I think more the the I, I think we we tend to sometimes as, you know, we're we're in this space and I can I can say we as NGOs who do this work, right? We've got mm -hmm. a preciousness about how we kind of define this is what we think healthy masculinity should be. I do think more research that some that listens to the stories of the, you know, hundreds and thousands of ways that men are their better selves and the better humans. Um I think we we kind of so much of the conversation about masculinity is about the crises and the harm. And there's no shortage of that. Right. Um, it's not like we should stop that part, but I do think more of it that leans into, you know, let's tell you know, let us tell thousands of stories of men who in some aspect of their life are just being, you know, honorable humans. And I know we've we've not wanted those voices to take over spaces for women and girls or for non-binary individuals, because historically women have not had the space to tell their stories. But somehow, how do we also find a space that that men and boys can see, you know, those those better sides of themselves? Um, in much more varied ways, right? Not just, you know, somebody who looks like those of us in these, you know, in the not-for-profit organizations who are doing the talking about it, but in their own words. Right. I think more that looks at, you know, the multiple ways that men do caregiving and care. Um, Cause I think we also end up measuring that and talking about that in kind of narrow ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in, you know, kind of how to, how do men and boys think about that? I think men's health, is a place that we need more understanding. We are not doing okay. We're less likely to seek medical provider when we need it. We're more likely to show up in the emergency room than women are. Um, we are less likely to take care. Men and women have kind of equal rates of mental health problems, but men are about half as likely to seek help for that. Um, and again, I just repeated what I just said we shouldn't do, which is more of the problem stuff. So I guess I'd also like to see some stories that show men who are seeking the help and the care they need um, right. and maybe what factors make that possible and why, you know, why men's health matters for others. Cause women pick up, pick up the pieces when we are ill and infirm or have a chronic, you know, a chronic disease, women most often pick up the pieces. So that would be another piece. Yeah. Yeah. And, and women's, you know, I think we'll put this in there as well. I think, you know, we we all make versions and ideas about manhood. I think more where we listen to women and girls about um, not just the harm you see, but, you know, the confusion, the your take on this. <laughs> um, as women, girls, and non-binary individuals, I think it's not just about asking men questions. We're, we're all, you know, making these ideas about manhood. Yeah, it's fascinating to learn from you the stats of the crises and how bad things are, but also the techniques on you know what's working that those three questions you gave yeah. that is such important work too okay my last question for you um and thank you everybody for your fantastic questions if i didn't get to it please feel free to send an email a follow-up email to dr barker um so my question for you is what is one thing you wish you knew when you were a boy or a young man mm -hmm. about masculinity and what would you tell your younger self today yeah um 
uh, yeah, I guess how to, you know, how to be, it, these, these were not the words that I would have used, but just how to be more emotionally authentic. You know, I, I mentioned this in the TED talk, which is how much we sort of, we build this shell around ourselves, right? To say, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Um, you will not get through to this vulnerability because um, I certainly remember, you know, in my peer group, just how much you were jumped on and how much I would jump on others, not mostly verbally, but sometimes physically as well. If somebody showed, if a boy, young man showed a vulnerability, I don't know about this, or I don't know about that, right? We got points, right? By bashing the other, right? The put down, the, you know, the ridicule. And often, not always, but often that was homophobic or it was something that I'm superior to you. And so it's just so like your day is about building the shell around you. Um, not always. And so the, you know, the importance of just like, be strong enough to, you know, you, you are, you get to show when you're vulnerable. It is okay to say that you need help. Um, and actually it's okay to say that you care, like just stop with that. I don't care bullshit. <laughs> um, in yeah. fact, it's that deep caring. That's what's going to get you through the day. Um, be, you know, be brave enough, like let that be bravery. Not the, not the way that, you know, I don't want to diss coaches. I had a couple of good ones and I have a couple of shit ones, <laughs> but you know, of like the coach who would berate you the you know, if, and as opposed to helping you be better, right. Where right. it was, it is in putting the other down that I get points, mm -hmm. like how to be brave enough to break out of that. Um, yeah. yeah. Deep caring. I love that. And I'm so grateful for all of the strategies and advice you gave us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Barker, for your brilliance, wisdom, and all of the work you do. Um, and thank you to everybody who's here for this fantastic webinar. We will put it up. Um, and please join us on following Thursdays at the same time to hear from other experts like Dr. Barker. Um, anyways, thank you so much. Thank you for yeah. being here. It's been a total pleasure. I appreciate thanks you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the work that you all do. We're, we're pleased and proud to partner with you all. Absolutely. Right back at you. All right. Take care, everybody. Take Bye. care. Bye.